Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Kuch Khas. This is actually my sister Shayan's enterprise, but she is stuck thanks to Icelandic fog or ash in London, and um, I'm standing in for her. But it's very nice to have you here. And I see that uh, Hussein has already launched his book here uh, last week at the Argentinian Embassy. But now, today we decided not just to have a book reading, but to have what we call a conversation. We don't quite know what this form will take. We don't know where it will go. Hussein and Zaheer have not met before. And just for those of you who don't know Zaheer, this is Zaheer Glass, who is a lawyer. I call him a bibliophile. He objected and said it sounded too pompous, but he is a bibliophile. He reads way more than any of us. And uh, he is interested in, in, in reading and in books and in fiction and in non-fiction. So let's see where this goes. I, I, I asked Hussein to do a little reading before, so it gave them both a sense of where they were, and then it's open to anything. Thank you. Thank you, Mouse. Uh, the three passages that uh, that herald the the, uh, the beginning of this book reflect that. There's the first passage is by F. Scott Fitzgerald from a piece he wrote called The Crack Up. Of course, uh, all life is a process of breaking down but the blows that do the dramatic side of the work, the big sudden blows that come or seem to come from the outside, the ones you remember and blame things on don't show their effect all at once. There is another sort of blow that comes from within that you don't feel until it's too late to do anything about until you realize with finality that in some regard you will never be a good man again. The second passage is from Fez and uh, Fez, from a uh, translation by Naomi Lazard. Uh, this band is from a poem entitled The Hour of Faithlessness. I ask my vagrant heart, where is there to go now? No one belongs to anyone at this hour, forget it. No one will receive you at this hour, let it go. Where can you possibly go now? The third passage is uh, from the canon of early hip-hop um, by an uh, artist duo uh, called Eric B. and Rakim. It's from the seminal treatise called You Got Soul. This is how it should be done. This style is identical to none. I begin from the beginning. Um, for those of you uh, who have fragile sensibilities, um, I advise you to hold your hats might be a bumpy ride. <laughs> We'd become Japs, Jews, niggers. We weren't before. We, we fancied ourselves boulevardiers, raconteurs, renaissance men, E.C., Jimbo and me. We were self-invented, self-made and, and certain we had our fingers on the pulse of the great global dialectic. We, we surveyed the times and the post and other treaties of mainstream discourse on a daily basis, consulted the voice weekly and often leafed through other publications with more discriminating audiences such as tight or, or big butt. Not that such grand themes moved or motivated Jimbo, propped against a wall like a benign overstuffed scarecrow he'd keep to himself, but, but at a late juncture he would grab you by the arm to articulate the conversation he'd been having in his head. Jimbo was known to converse in malpropisms and portamentos, his deliberate locutions characterized by irregular inflection of voice, by rhyme, if not rationale. 
On the face of it, he was a space cadet that he knew, but we knew he knew what was what. Unlike AC or me, he had a steady girlfriend and as a DJ slash producer, a vocation with certain cachet. But if his career trajectory opened doors in the city, it estranged him from his septuagenarian father, a retired foreman settled in Jersey City for a quarter of a century. In that time, he'd raised a son, a daughter, and, and several notable edifices on either side of the Hudson. Born and bred in Jersey, Jimbo was a bona fide American. As for me, they called me Chuck, and it stuck. I was growing up, but thought I was grown up, was and remained not so tall, lean, angular like my late father, I had brown eyes, tint tinted, brown hair, tint tinted eyes, a sharp nose, like an eaglet, my mother liked to say. I had arrived in New York from Karachi four years earlier to attend college, which I completed swimmingly in three. And though I was the only expatriate amongst us, like to believe I had since claimed the city. And the city had claimed me. Thank you. Let's start with the, the fact that I was talking about 9-11 novels, and there's, there's a lot of 9-11 no novels out there. Um, for example, Mohsin Hamid did his Reluctant Fundamentalist, and there are other novels as well. In, in what way, or in, in what sense do you feel that your novel differs, or that you have another story to tell? Or how does 9-11 actually come into the whole situation? When, um, when I started writing Homeboy, which was perhaps November 2003, there was no 9-11 literature. Um, so Jonathan Safran Foer, Ewan McEwen, Ken Kaflos, and Joseph O'Neill had not written in response to this, uh, this sort of, um, this tragedy. <clears throat> So at the time it was uh, very exciting, very novel. Um, by the time it was published, there was a body of work that um, in some way um, I had to respond to. But I think every historic event, every tragedy produces a body of literature. So here and now in the 21st century, um, there are writers writing about World War I and World War II the Holocaust. Um, there are writers who write about tragedies in our part of the world. There's partition. I wish, uh, I wish people would write about Kashmir or Gujarat or, or uh, you know, uh, parts of the world that uh, escape the attention of a literary discourse. My aspiration is, uh, was to respond um, and I think, um, and I was, I was in the States at the time. Um, what I hear, my novel would have been dramatically different. It would not have, um, I wouldn't have written to allay my anxieties in a very unsettled time in the States. Um, I just happened to be in the States while I was working on this novel. How, how does it work that way? You have to distance yourself, you have to cut yourself off from everything, you sit back, you lock yourself away. I'm temperamentally um, not particularly sociable, um, so it, it sort of works. I, I spend about eight hours of the day with myself uh, when I'm writing. And so uh, it's tough uh, in many ways, uh, but it sort of appeals appeals to me in other ways. It's tough for the people around me. I think I I, I sever relationships. I, 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 I'm, I'm unable to maintain relationships uh, because I don't have uh, I, I have such a peculiar schedule that it doesn't really allow me to do much. Um, so I can handle it. I don't know if others can as well, and I, I empathize with uh, the people around me. What question I've been dying to ask you is, have your parents read the novel? <laughs> um, they have. Uh, my father was one of the 
first um, people who read um, the, 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 the completed draft and uh, I was anxious what he'd think uh, and he liked it and it was very heartening. If, if, if we don't have a... Okay. Does anybody want to ask any other questions? Anything? Or should we... I need a cigarette now, so... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.